Hi guys, it's me again, um, back to explore some more effects of imperialism on this time period. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to compare China and Japan and the way that they were influenced and how they responded to Western imperialism. Um, so we're going to see some various um, effects. So let's start with China. All right, so last that we studied China, we looked at the rise of the Qing Dynasty that we have to remember is technically a foreign group that is ruling over China, um, the Manchu coming in. And a couple other things I want us to remember um, is that ultimately they restored a lot of Chinese culture and continued a lot of Chinese practices. Um, and uh, even though the Ming Dynasty was very much hurt by the Silver Dynasty, China still is the largest market in the world, the largest um, single economy, uh, and definitely is more powerful, at least economically, than Europe. Militaristically, it's hurting a little bit because China took its eye off the ball a touch by the time we reached the 1800s. <clears throat> There's been less of a focus on science and transportation technology, more of a focus on the humanities. And also by the time we get to the 1800s, there's a lot of corruption, a lot of really poor leadership. So China's not in a great spot. That said, as we enter into the 1800s, China's more powerful economically. Um, and so there's a great trade imbalance between China and all the European powers, but we'll focus on the British because they're the first to really push it with China. Um, and uh, so here in this cartoon, um, we can see the view um, of the Europeans at the time, um, that here they are like kind of kowtowing and like offering so much stuff to uh, the Manchu leadership. The Manchu leader is shown here um, as, you know, kind of very like fat, chubby. Um, so they're kind of, that symbolizes how rich they are. Here they are laying out a lot of like European goods. We can tell they just don't want them. He's like sitting back. He's like, nah, I don't need this. Because you have to think about what did the, what did the British have to offer really? Um, they don't have much, especially post silver trade. They really don't have much to offer. So there's a great trade imbalance between China and Britain, um, and uh, the British are are pretty frustrated by that. And so when they see they don't have much to sell them, um, and then they start to look at a new resource that's become available to them when they conquered parts of northern India, they get an idea. Like, so if we can't sell them any of our goods, let's sell them a good of a place we just conquered. This good happens to be really addictive, so let's sell them some opium. Um, and thus we start to see the rise of the opium trade. Now, opium had already been traded locally, but the escalation of the opium trade is wild. So much opium, it's crazy. Um, this is a sketch of an opium warehouse, um, and each one of these, um, uh, like baskets pretty much, um, or pots, uh, holds, um, I'm forgetting actually right now. Um, I think I have it on later side, All right, but a decent amount of opium. It escalates insanely. The opium trade totally eclipsed the cocaine trade in the 80s, just to give us a little sense of scale here. Um, so the Brits knew what they were doing. They saw that opium could be quite addictive. Um, they had been playing with it within their own medicine, as we talked about in class. Um, and so they recognized that if they could start to sell that to China and people would get hooked on it, then they would consistently make money off of China, right? It's kind of a no brainer for them. Um, all right. So this is giving us a sense. Oh, there we go. Um, this is giving us a sense for just how much opium was traded and the escalation of that trade. So from, um, like 1650 through 1775, we're only talking about, um, about on average 75, um, uh, what is this doing right here? So 75 tons um, of uh, opium traded per year, which is nothing. Um, and by the time we get to, let's look at 1835, no, let's look at 1863, um, as we inch towards the opium wars, um, we're talking 4,000 tons of opium that is traded in a very short period of time. Um, so by 1838, um, there's somewhere between four and 12 million opium addicts. We don't know the numbers for sure, um, but it's up there and, uh, that's a high percentage of people and it would be very concentrated. It would wipe out like whole cities. There'd be, the countryside were largely unaffected, but the cities where the production and where seats of government were, were heavily, heavily affected. Again, just to give you a sense of, um, the comparison, um, the cocaine trade in, um, in like the late eighties, early nineties only ever reached um, about uh, sometimes one to 2,000 tons of cocaine um, traded in the United States per year. Um, 
as opposed to in 1863, over 4,000 tons of opium traded, and by 1880, almost 7,000 tons of opium um, brought into China. So this makes Queen Victoria the biggest drug pusher in history. Just saying. Um, and here's some imagery, right, looking at the opium addicts. And the thing about opium is not only is it highly addictive, um, you can kind of consistently smoke it forever. Uh, and it doesn't, it won't like kill you. You won't like directly overdose like, like you might heroin or some other opiate like that. Um, and in a way, I, I don't want to say it makes it more dangerous because of course dying is more dangerous, but what makes it um, really scary and problematic to the Chinese government is that you just have these people who have completely given up all their productivity their responsibilities to their family, and all they're doing is laying around and smoking all the time, um, but they're not dying, so it's like hard to get the public to freak out. And of course the public cared. Um, it was just like a slow, creeping mess of an issue. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that by the mid-1800s, uh, Europe, <clears throat> specifically Britain, had begun to outlaw the usage of opium for their own citizens, and yet they were escalating the trade to China. Um, if you look at your notes, I have an excerpt from Commissioner Lin, who worked for the uh, Qing dynasty, for the Qing government, to Queen Victoria. Um, before the Opium Wars, they tried diplomacy to say, like, hey, like maybe we can work something out here. Um, and in his letter, he says, I'm told in your own country, opium smoking is forbidden under severe penalties. This means you're aware of how harmful it is. So long as you don't take yourselves, but continue to make it and tempt the people of China to buy it, you're showing yourselves careful of your own lives, but careless of the lives of other people, indifferent in your greed um, for gain to the harm you do to others. Such conduct is repugnant to human feeling and at variance with the way of heaven. So really calling out the hypocrisy of the Victorian government um, that they have banned it for themselves, but continue to sell it to the Chinese. Um, <clears throat> nothing happens as a result of this. The Chinese official continue to try to ban it, and then they try to blockade their own ports to stop the opium ships from coming. But we have to remember that the Chinese have not had a strong naval tradition in a long time, and definitely um, what they have is nothing compared to what the British have in this moment. Um, and thus we have the, a series of opium wars in the mid-1800s, and the Chinese get wrecked. Um, the, the British win it summarily, um, and force the Chinese to sign a series of unequal treaties. Um, and at this point, what we need to recognize is that the British are not politically colonizing China. But what they're able to do with these treaties makes the Chinese pretty impotent, right, within their own government, um, makes them pretty dependent on the British. Um, so this Treaty of Nanjing is going to lay out a couple of things. I think I have actually another set of opium smokers. Here we go. It's also kind of strange how many people posed as um, as opium smokers. Like in the back, these people just laying out. Like, yeah, take my picture. I guess they're just going to be laying around anyway, so they could do the um, the kind of wet plate, like slow developed photography. Like, why not? But it's very strange how much people are posing right with their drugs. Um, here's an imagery of the opium wars. Very kind of famous image right here. All right, so here's a sampling of the type of um, uh, agreements that were part of the uh, Treaty of Nanjing and all, and all these series of unequal treaties. All right, so first, um, the British required that the Chinese reimburse the British for how, all the money that the British spent fighting the Chinese, which just further puts the Chinese in debt um, to the British. And the more you are in debt to a nation, the more dependent you are on them, first economically and then eventually politically. Um, the British reserved certain ports uh, so that they could monopolize trade in that region. And if you control the trade in a place, you're controlling the politics. Um, the one place that the Chinese hand over is Hong Kong, uh, which I'll show you where that is in the map if you're unfamiliar. And by giving up Hong Kong, which is one of the most productive ports, um, that's, that's really going to hurt the Chinese. And it's also going to create complicated political relationships between Hong Kong and China in the modern day. Um, Hong Kong, so as part of the treaties, the British promised to repatriate Hong Kong back to mainland China in the late 1990s, and they did so. Um, but the problem is that Hong Kong developed as a capitalist region, um, as well as having pretty decent measures of free speech. And then eventually when it's reincorporated back into mainland China, um, which at that point had developed as a quote-unquote communist nation, it's not an easy transition. Um, so 
economically, it can be kind of tough. And then recently, there's been issues of free and fair elections and um, freedoms of speech. So it's going to create complications down the road. Um, another um, part of the treaties is that the British citizens were granted extraterritoriality. Anytime we see that term, we need to take note. Whenever a nation is granted extraterritoriality, that means that they do not have to abide by the laws of the nation they're living in. Instead, they abide by their own nation's laws. So as a British citizen living in China, they don't have to abide by Chinese law, which means that you're doing whatever you want, that you have pretty unchecked power. So even though the British are not colonizing China, they are politically really doing whatever they want and controlling it. Um, this had less to do with criminal law. And even though I am sure there are many examples of Brits committing violent crimes or stealing or other kind of nasty, nasty horrible stuff and getting away with it, I'm sure that that happened. What's really problematic is that um, this would uh, hurt the Chinese citizens when the British would sometimes claim certain territories, say like, oh, this is my land. Um, and sometimes it was very difficult for the Chinese to do anything or sometimes decide that if they did purchase a piece of land, whether rightfully or shadily, um, that they could charge certain taxes. So it just, it just makes it really difficult for the Chinese to stand up to the British. So anytime we see one nation grant the other citizens extraterritoriality, we need to be wary and start to look for ways in which um, they are imposing imperial ideas without actually colonizing that place. Um, so here's Hong Kong, in case you didn't know. Right, so um, yeah, kind of our southern edge of China. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where it is. Really, really important spot. Um, all right, so when the British begin um, to exert their influence, then other nations are going to get a little jealous because this is the market that everyone's had their eye on for a long time. Great, powerful China. It's been our superpower for the entirety of world history that we have been studying. So in this political cartoon, what we're looking at is the great nations, um, I guess the great nations, but um, the nations, the mostly imperial nations um, in this region of this time, carving up the China pie um, and looking at what slices that they wanted for themselves and carving out their quote unquote spheres of influence, right? So what a crafty way to still exert imperialism, but not to colonize. So... We are in some way making peace with the Chinese emperor, making them feel like, oh, no, you're still in power. We're just going to influence this re region and help you all economically, right, in this kind of paternalistic way. Um, but this is a form of economic imperialism, which then results in political imperialism. All right, so our figures here that we're looking at, um, <clears throat> uh, obviously at the top is the Manchu emperor trying to stop the whole thing from happening, shown in a very cartoonish, caricaturish way. Um, here you have Queen Victoria, right? And we know um, that the Brits are carving out their spot. We have a German Kaiser, um, or which would be uh, yeah, Bismarck at the time, um, who's also going to carve out a space. We have the Russians, who are growing as an imperial power. They're going to do a little bit of a land grab. We have the French, looking at what's good for them. And then, let's note here, the Japanese. So at the end of this lecture, we'll look at how the Japanese not only have opened up their borders again, but have themselves become an imperial power. They want to play the European game. And so they also are going to grab some space. Um, and so by taking over certain parts of China, by challenging the government, the these European and Japanese powers are causing the um, tribute system uh, to be dismantled a bit. And some nations that were originally part of China will no longer be part of China. Right, so notably, um, some of what we, is, we know as Vietnam or Indochina will no longer pay tribute to China, but will belong to France. Burma um, will belong to England for this time period. And Korea and Taiwan will technically become independent as these buffer states via Japan and their actions. <clears throat> Although it's still gonna, they're still going to gonna be caught um, in a lot of wars. Um, and this is a pretty crappy map, but I like it. I don't know why. I'm um, showing exactly where those spheres of influence were. Um, and so uh, the Russian sphere, Russian sphere of influence um, should really be no surprise. They're taking a chunk 
um, uh, closer to what is Manchuria, so that they can complete the Trans-Siberian Railroad um, and get to the Sea of Japan um, to complete their own manifest destiny um, or their completion of their empire from sea to sea. Uh, the Japanese are taking lots of stuff, right? So they're taking a series of islands that um, the Chinese and the Japanese still fight over. They technically will quote unquote free twi Taiwan, but Taiwan is, is, is going to be indebted to the Japanese via this and then take over some southern sections of China. They're also going to inch and take um, um, what is north of Korea. And over time, they're going to take over more of China. And we'll see in the 30s, um, they will occupy great swaths of China as Japan grows its own empire and as we inch towards World War II. Um, the Germans uh, will take the mouth of the Yellow River for their own industrial production. Um, the British are going to take in and around Shanghai because it's, you know, really um, very uh, productive region, so they want to make a ton of money. And the French are going to take um, southern China on the edge of what is already one of their colonies, um, Indochina, known as uh, Vietnam. Right, so they're taking this in order to create a buffer state between whatever the other European and Japanese groups are doing, as well as the Chinese, and to really assert their claim over uh, Vietnam. All right, so <clears throat> what are the emperors and empresses doing in this moment? Um, at this point, we have some of the most inept emperors and empresses um, who are in some ways hoping to collude with the Europeans to make some cash. Um, are just also sometimes just so deeply isolated in the Forbidden City that via that isolation, they're just making bad choices. Um, and I don't want to blame everything on the Empress Dowager, Dowager Sishi. Um, she just has some of the greatest stories, so you know we'll emphasize her. But from the late 1700s through the mid 1800s, we just have a series of really inept emperors, um, and that's in a way why she was able to rise to power. So the Empress Dowager. <clears throat> was not part of the imperial family. She was an imperial concubine, so she wasn't married to any of the emperors. Um, she wasn't a, a, a royal daughter of any of the emperors, but she was a concubine who lived in the Forbidden City um, and essentially manipulated and killed her way to the top um, and was able to become the empress. It's a pretty intriguing and very interesting story. I wonder if there's a movie about her. There should be. There's some pretty great books about her. You should probably YouTube her or something. Um, uh, they called her the Dragon Lady, right? So a lot of exciting and interesting stuff. And even though it makes for uh, maybe a really good story, it doesn't make for good leadership um, because she's trying to preserve power the whole time when China needed the most protection. One of the most infamous stories is that she had raised a bunch of tax money that she was supposed to buy all these weapons. And instead of buying these weapons, she bought this um, or had constructed this marble boat that um, completed the summer palace outside of Beijing. And here it is. I visited it. It's, it's cool. I mean, it's pretty, but like they needed weapons. And I still wonder if they had all those weapons, if they would have been able to beat the British. I mean, the British are just <clears throat> so damn good right now. Um, but it just kind of shows you the type of decision making that just wasn't working out for China in this time period. All right. So <clears throat> as the Europeans and the Japanese are inching into China, we also have so many rebellions happening in the mid 1800s. China is a mess. Um, so we have some rebellions that are strictly anti-foreigner. And then we have other rebellions that are just looking to totally leave China, like reform the system, leave um, and just live in a different way because we have populations of China that have been exposed to new ideas, um, whether via Christianity, whether via the Enlightenment, whether through just some people kind of having social mobility and getting educated. Um, and so some of those movements include the self-strengthening and 100 days reform. It's in your notes. So they were looking to kind of blend some Chinese philosophies and adopt some forms of Western traditions and education and industrialize and extend civil liberties and have a constitutional monarchy, like get a parliament instead of having um, this kind of divine right a mandate of heaven system, um, and they really hated the Empress Dowager and the Qing Conservatives, stuff like that. Um, one of the most interesting and I think significant movements is the Taiping Rebellion. Taiping meaning um, the Great Peace, um, and that was started by Hong um, Xu Quan, excuse my pronunciation, 
um, who started the separatist movement and he wanted to create his own um, secessionist movement that he also named the Kingdom of Heavenly Peace. So a little bit of background on him. Um, he converted to evangelical Christianity um, when he was, I, I'm thinking like in his early 20s. Uh, he had failed the civil service exam many times um, and then began to study with the Christians because they opened schools and then converted. Um, and it said that he had some visions uh, and those visions inspired him to leave the government. So one of those visions that he had is that he himself is the brother of Jesus. Um, so Jesus, <laughs> Southern Chinese brother. And, um, and that uh, it was his job right, to save China from their evils. In one of his visions, he was given a sword that he was supposed to use to slay the demons of China. And those demons are Buddhism and, um, and Confucianism. Um, he had another dream that he saw that he saw Confucius burning in the flames of hell. Um, and so with these types of visions and also with the influence of things like the Enlightenment and, and just reading widely, um, he established a secessionist government. Um, and in the secessionist government, there's a lot of things going on. First, he pushed for more gender um, equality or equity. Um, but at the same time, sex separation. So he wanted men and women to have equal or close to equal participation within government. But he did believe uh, that um, hypersexuality can take away from your virtue. And so men and women often live separated. Um, but as I said, he was looking for more equality. And that even included um, ending foot binding. Um, he believed in a in an attempt at a classless society. He banned private property, obviously banning opium and anything but Christianity. Um, so it's like a precursor, right, to the communist movement, right, um, but with some extra values added in. Um, he did believe that there needed to be leaders within the government, um, and so he rewrote the civil service exam to reflect his values, which maybe it's just he just wanted to pass the exam once in his lifetime, who knows. Um, but this is the foundation of the Taiping movement, and it was pretty popular. Um, so if you look at this French map, I don't know why it's French, um, by 1854, there was a pretty big following in, in and around southern China. Um, so the red area um, is the, the, the region of the, the Taiping secessionist government, um, and that's it's definitely going to threaten the Chinese government as well as the European and Japanese holdings. Um, and so the Europe, I'm sorry, the emperors or empress um, and the government uh, responds <clears throat> um, really violently towards it. Um, and so, oh yeah, the dates. Uh, the Taiping movement is from 1850 to 1864, so it's a long time. Um, and there's you know, tens of millions of people who join the movement. Um, and I already mentioned all this type of stuff before. Um, I also want to introduce this concept. Uh, the Taiping Rebellion is one of the mil many millenarian movements um, that existed. Um, a millenarian movement uh, is a movement which believes that they have um, a responsibility to create a particular society that will prepare its followers for the coming of the end of the world. Um, there's going to be a lot of that type of stuff. Um, and, uh, and the Taiping Rebellion is an example of that, that they needed to create this in order to be quote unquote saved. Um, so um, the, the Taiping movement is a threat. And so the, the Chinese government will work with some of the foreign powers to crush the Taiping Rebellion. There's about 20 million casualties in the war to crush the Taiping Rebellion. 20 million casualties. That's so many people in just one section of China. So that's really devastating. Um, and uh, we're about to, well, it's actually in the next unit that we take a look at how many people died between the mid-1800s and the mid-1900s. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing anyone's left in China after that stretch of time. Um, this is a, a scroll painting um, of the imperial forces coming into and burning and killing so many of the Taiping secessionists. So it's real bad stuff. Another one of the movements, um, one that I think is really interesting, is the Boxer Rebellion. So the Boxers, many people often know this, but the Boxer Rebellion um, was a rebellion of farmers who created this secret society, and the name is wonderful, um, that the official name for the Boxers was the Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fists. So good. There's already like a punk band named after it, so it can't be your band's name. Um, but the boxers were called the boxers because they were generally Taoists and they performed lots of martial arts. And belie they believed that foreigners were evil, that the emperor was um, 
and the imperial government was evil for colluding with the foreigners, and that um, that their movement was right and good and protected right by by the heavens, um, and so they uh, took up um, military action against the foreigners and attacked them. They're called the Boxers, though, because they didn't believe that they needed weapons, or at least they didn't need bullets, and that they themselves would be impervious to bullets because they were so pure. We've seen this before in history. It's never true. No one is impervious to bullets. Um, and so as they came at the um, Europeans, notably the British, um, they marched with simple weapons, and they marched with their fists. Um, the closest that the Europeans had ever seen to people fighting with their hands like that is boxing, and so they gave them the name the Boxers, but instead, of course, they were doing martial arts. Um, this is a failed movement um, because they're unmatched, um, or they're outmatched, but one of our many, many different types of rebellions happening at this time period. Um, this is another one of those stereograms I showed you before, um, looking at the boxer. So you can see it's kind of a ragtag group of people, but this is how pissed off the Chinese people are that they're willing to um, take up um, their arms, well, in this case, literally their arms, um, against the foreign government and their own imperial government. Um, so, by the time we reach the early 1900s, we have our last emperor. Um, he's only a couple years old um, when he comes to the throne, baby Puyi. Um, and so at this point, China's a mess. We have multiple rebellion movements. We have the Europeans carving out spheres of influence. Um, we have the Japanese encroaching on more and more land. Um, and so through a series of political conflicts, um, uh, the Europeans and the rebel governments force the emperor to abdicate the throne um, and so then we have our final emperor so we'll see that transition of power and the power vacuum and the civil wars that transpire in the 20th century because of that so china is getting wrecked due to the imperial powers japan on the other hand takes a different route right so japan when um, confronted with foreign powers at first will have to transport its government um, but they empower themselves through it instead of um, falling to these powers. All right, so how does it happen? Um, as we know, Japan, I'm sorry for the cheesy joke, um, Japan, starting in the mid-1600s, uh, had chosen to close its borders, excuse me, um, fearful of imperial power, rightly so. Um, so the Tokugawa government issued the closed country edicts, and um, close their borders with very limited and regulated trade, right, for like about 200 years. Um, the U.S. wanted to get in on all this imperial stuff. They had heard about the manufacturing capacity of Japan. Um, they also wanted it as a layover to China. Um, and so um, they uh, sent their military to forcibly open up China. Um, and this expedition was led by Commodore Matthew C. Perry. Um, so I need to make a friend's joke with that. One thing I think is really funny is that um, up through the late like 1980s and early 1990s, any history book that talks about this time period just calls Commodore Matthew C. Perry. They just call him Matthew Perry, Commodore Matthew Perry. And then the show Friends comes up and the, you know, the actor that plays Chandler you know, starts to get credit. And then history books and articles begin to refer to Commodore Perry as Commodore Matthew C. Perry as if we're really going to mix them up. I think that's ridiculous. So that's not really Com Commodore Perry. This is Commodore Perry. Um, and I do want to take a second to enjoy Japanese depictions of Americans. Um, I think it's really interesting. Every group characterizes other groups. Um, and the Japanese have their own way of doing so. Um, so this is, um, you know, a photograph of Matthew Perry. This is a woodblock cut of Matthew C. Perry. So, I mean, just in a very Japanese style. and They kind of put him in their own versions of um, a military uniform. But the heavy emphasis on his jowliness and his hairiness. And here's another really awesome example of it. Um, so the Japanese considered the Americans disgusting, which is fair, um, because compared to Japanese... Um, uh, hygiene patterns. The Americans were not nearly as hygienic. Also, if we're talking about basic genetics, um, Eastern Europeans just simply don't grow facial hair to the same extent as, um, I forget what I said there, uh, Eastern, East Asians don't grow facial hair nearly to the same extent as Europeans generally do or European descended peoples. Um, and also, we need to recognize that this is the mid to late 
1800s, right? This is the era of the Civil War. This is the era of General side, um, Burnside, right? So the beards and the sideburns and all the hair, it was in fashion at this time. Not to mention that these dudes have been on a ship for so long. So these American soldiers are rolling up all stinky and super hairy. And as compared to the Japanese, <laughs> they're gross. Um, so they often portrayed the um, Americans as hairy, as angry, um, as rude and stinky. They refer to them as long-nosed goblins or tengu, um, uh, which uh, is, is exactly how Matthew Perry is shown here. Um, here's some other examples too. Um, so these are a couple different generals. One is Perry, one is not. I love these like tornado brows. Like I guess that's the thing you could do. Or like, I don't know. It is ridiculous. And often they'd show the Americans with their mouths open, um, depicting how loud they were, which I guess is also kind of fair. Um, this is, oh, no, this isn't it. Um, I don't know, just more, more of the Americans, Matthew Perry and some of his other, um, lieutenants and whatnot there. Harry and loud and powerful. Okay. I'll get to my other image in a second. Um, and so the way in which, um, the Americans were able to open up the Japanese borders is um, through a policy they called gunboat diplomacy, which of course is an oxymoron. And they sent the great American black ships, these gigantic steam powered ships um, that were so big and beautiful, intimidating. They were painted black or iron sided sometimes, um, really beautiful. So there's four big ships and a lot of other smaller support ships that were sent. Um, the Japanese were super intimidated. The Japanese don't have a strong naval tradition anymore because they were so isolated and people were just coming to them. So their isolationist um, decision worked in the for the first like generation or two, but as we can see, set them at a disadvantage. And so they're going to lose. They're going to lose these battles with the um, with the Americans. So as they lose this battle with the Americans, um, the Americans begin to have larger influence, and they're going to be there. Um, and uh, and here is one of my favorite images, maybe in all of world history. Um, but this is an image produced um, by the Japanese called the exotic white man. And this is a warning to the Japanese to not let the Americans um, have too much influence over them. And definitely right, to not let the Americans intermarry um, with the women of Japan. Uh, and so what is happening here, um, and I'm sure that... Um, you might have your own interpretations. I kind of wish we were talking about this together. Um, this isn't sort of some goblin leprechaun with very strange uh, anatomy, kind of just jigging about and some lady, I don't know, like as his hype man. Um, this is the depiction of a birth. So this is a baby. This is the mama. Can you imagine giving birth to this? Um, and this is the father. Here's the midwife. Um, so what is happening here is as this Japanese woman has had a child with an American man, we know this is an American man because of his beard. Um, and, uh, the baby, I guess, was born with a beard takes after his father. Um, and what we're saying here is that if Japanese women, um, have children with these Americans, they will give birth to a monster, that the Americans are monsters, um, that this genetic invasion, um, will result in more monsters. And there's a really disturbing, um, tiny detail in this that I want to point out to you. Um, and it's what's going on right here, right in this guy's like crotch. So that's not just like a weird flower. If we go back to some of the other images, um, we'll go here. What's depicted um, on his crotch right there are epaulets. And epaulets um, are uh, decorative shoulder pieces that are worn in military costuming in Europe. Um, usually by high-ranking officials. And by moving that from his shoulders to his, his groin, um, we're talking about the weaponization right, of sexuality. And we're offering the possibility that any sexual interaction between a Japanese woman and an American man was not consensual. And also that these men, by coupling with the Japanese women, that this is part of the general invasion Right, as I said before, this is part of the genetic invasion. Because if you if you genetically invade a place, you're there to stay. Right, even if you lose some battles and if you're kicked out of certain regions, of in this case Japan, but but now you have heirs there. Now you have children. Right, now you have genetic stock in the region. So very fearful that if these Europeans have children with our Japanese women, that we'll never get rid of them. So this propaganda piece is trying to scare people away from that. So it's pretty powerful. 
All right, so what goes on? Um, the U.S. win, right, because our military is growing at the time, and uh, the Japanese were not so good at it, right? The samurai had really lost their place during the Tokugawa period. Um, so very similar to the British in China, um, the Americans make the Japanese sign a series of um, unequal treaties. Um, the biggest treaty is the Treaty of Kanagawa, um, and some of the big um, sections of the of the treaty said that the your, um, the J Americans would never have to pay any tariffs, um, and that the Americans were granted extraterritoriality, right? So we know to be wary of that word. So now the, the Americans are going to have a great deal of power in the region. Um, after this, so like I've said, this the Americans are not colonizing Japan, right, but are exerting a lot of economic influence. Um, the general Japanese population is pretty angry at the Tokugawa shoguns, right, for losing to the Americans. And they're also itching for a change as it was. Um, there was a lot of resentment for the fact that the merchants were kind of like so rich and powerful that other groups had nothing, that the samurai were kind of this um, sad um, mess of a class that really lost their place. So there's a lot of discontent in Japan anyway. Um, so we do have a series of civil wars. Um, that happen after the Americans open up the borders. It's like where you get the movie The Last Samurai and stuff. Um, and the winner of these civil wars is the, the Meiji family, um, eventually led by Emperor Mutsuhiro. Um, so th this next time period is known as the Meiji Restoration. Um, and so now we've they're installing an emperor for the first time, and they're going to centralize power. And they're going to mimic a lot of what the Europeans do. This is Emperor Mutsuhiro. He's 19 years old um, when he's installed to power. Um, and so this is when Japan modernizes, as I said, mimics what the Europeans are doing. And now Japan's about to be become a world competitor, a world leader. And we know they become really powerful um, as we see their actions in World War II. Um, they sign a constitution. I think this image is really important. Um, if you look at this, um, this wood block cut of the signing of the Meiji constitution, uh, we can see how much the Japanese have embraced European and Western styles in general. Right, so the men, I mean, this looks very European here. First off, they're doing their best to like grow some beards, as you might see, um, and some mustaches, right? So the thing that they mocked, they begin to embrace. Um, their pants and their suit jackets, um, their sashes, their like trifold hats is just so European. So they have abandoned the samurai costuming um, and are wearing Western dress. The women are wearing the bustles, the very Victorian dress. It looks like, you know, costuming of a Council Rock North Sock and Buskin uh, show. Um, so um, deeply, deeply embracing that. Um, even the way, like some of the patterns and whatnot, aren't, some of them are very Japanese, but others are not. So it's this mixture of Japanese and European style, but they're embracing European stuff or Western style stuff. It's very evident. Um, and in terms of the Meiji reforms, so one of the first uh, movements of the Meiji um, are to send Japanese scholars throughout the world to figure out what are the other parts of the world doing well and how can we learn from that. Um, and so this is pretty smart stuff, and this is actually very Japanese, as we'll see throughout history. Um, they, they don't often invent their own stuff. They sit back, they watch other people do stuff, they study it, they embrace it, and they make it better, right? They did that with the Americans and our, you know, automobile technology and our televisions and our computers and stuff like that. And it starts right now. So they'll send scholars around the world, they'll send them to Germany, to the United States, to England to look at, you know, what do their factories look like? What works for them? What doesn't work for them? And apply it in China. I'm sorry, in Japan. Um, they begin to strip the daimyo or the nobles of their power and enforce more of a meritocracy. Uh, the emperor is given a ton more power, and they do create a constitutional monarchy, though the emperor is super powerful. The constitutional monarchy um, splits power between the emperor and the diet, which is a kind of a similar thing as a parliament. Um, they modernize the military by uh, obviously giving them guns and modern weaponry, uh, which means the samurai, um, even though they still are expected to uphold bushido and train and be these cultural symbols, they're just not the same anymore. Um, and so they're going to be, it's kind of sad and shameful what happens to them. They just kind of become these big old has-beens. Um, but the military is obviously modernized. They mandate two years of military service 
for all men, which not only bulks up their military, but creates the sense of nationalism and patriotism, and we know where that's going. And also, this is where the Zaibatsu system comes in, as we discussed, via industrialization. Um, these cartels with vertical monopolies that transformed the economy, right? So China falters in the face of European imperialism, but Japan learns and they themselves become an imperial power um, as they, they immediately turn that onto the Chinese. Um, and as we should know, and as we'll revisit, um, expand their empires and become a true military force by the time we reach World War II. All right, so we'll leave that there and okay, bye.